Meeting number 13 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Councilmember Tyson, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Pastor Charles Peterson is here from Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church. Thank you, Pastor, for praying with us this evening. President Hardin, council members and neighbors, I wish to greet you on behalf of the several thousand evangelical Lutherans in Columbus and the several hundred of us uh, just down on 3rd and Fulton. We've been there since 1856 and we're delighted to be in the city for good. Um, as, we, as I pray in accordance with our faith, I uh, urge you to pray in accordance with yours. Gracious God, bless this city and make it a flourishing place for all people celebrating our diversity in religion, ancestry, culture, and sexual identity. Give us grace and courage to work for a city with whole and vibrant neighborhoods where none are lost or forgotten, but where all are supported and where the arts, knowledge, and commerce flourish. Make, a, make the diverse fabric of this city a delight to all who live here and who visit here and unite us around common goals for the good of all. And Almighty God, we especially lift before you all who govern the city of Columbus. May those who hold power understand that it is a trust from you to be used, not for personal gain or glory, but to serve all people here. Drive from all of us cynicism, selfishness, and corruption, and give us grace to live together in unity and mutual respect. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Clerk, call the roll, please. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. This week's communication received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Yes, President Hardin, members of council, we have, there is a letter addressed to the city clerk from the Board of Elections dated February 28, 2018, stating the following. Upon final examination of the project, I've had to make some adjustments to our original certification. I hereby certify that the board has examined the part petitions for initiated charter amendment, city council reform, received by our office from you on February 13, 2018. The numbers of valid and invalid signatures on the part petitions for the prospective initiative are as follows. Total signatures 38,734, valid signatures 16,975. Percentage of valid signatures submitted relative to the number of total raw signatures 43.8%. 
There were also 94 invalid part petitions containing 3,616 signatures. The total number of voters, electors that participated in the 2017 general municipal election was 110,292. The number of electors who represent 10% of the total electors is 11,030. Please let us know if we may be of further assistance. Sincerely, Jeff Mackey, Manager, Petitions and Filings, Franklin County Board of Elections. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions to be uh, by members of council? Council Member Elizabeth Brown. Yes, I do have one resolution to present tonight. Um, resolution 0015X-2018 um, would my guests uh, Kathleen Hadis and James Bond please approach? To recognize and celebrate March is Purchasing Month and to applaud the commitment to excellence of public and private purchasing and supply management professionals in providing goods and services essential to regional economic growth. Purchasing and supply management professionals often perform their work with little notice behind the scenes. However, they have a tremendous impact in Columbus and throughout Central Ohio. In total, purchasing professionals spend billions of dollars every year and positively influence our economy. They're on the front lines of responsible stewardship of our tax dollars, whether it is keeping costs down through aggregating purchases with regional partners or ensuring the quality and integrity of purchasing systems, they make a significant di difference in the daily operations of the city. Purchasing professionals are also organized and best practices are promoted through associations like the Central Ohio Organization of Public Purchasers and the Institute for Supply Management. These groups focus on advancing important priorities like diversity and equity in supply chains. March is Purchasing Month, helps highlight the significant role purchasing professionals play in business, industry, and government. It's your moment to step out from behind the curtain for some much earned appreciation. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn the microphone over, I want to see if any of my colleagues have anything to add. And I will also move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. And I would invite you to say a few words. March is a is procurement month, as you mentioned. It's a special month for uh, public procurement professionals uh, as we celebrate this nationwide. We greatly appreciate being recognized tonight for our accomplishments in this field, but more importantly, it's a month for all of us to appreciate the underlying theme of public procurement, one of promoting the importance of how well executed public procurement policies add tremendous, uh, tremendously to the efficiency and effectiveness of city government, serving our taxpayers and ratepayers by acquiring necessary goods and services at maximum value while maintaining a reputation of fairness and integrity. And we very much appreciate uh, what you've done tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Thank you, President Hardin. This evening I have resolution 0051X-2018, and as I am reading the title, I would like to ask President Crystal Causey and all the women of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated Central Ohio Chapter to please come down to the podium. And again, Resolution 0051X-2018 is to declare March as Women's History Month and to commemorate the community service of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated Central Ohio Chapter. The National Coalition of 100 Black Women was founded in Chap Central Ohio Chapter was founded in 1981 and was chartered in September 2011 by 35 proud African American women with a goal of developing a leadership forum. The coalition has an outstanding standing record of empowering black females and its mission is to advocate on behalf of black women and girls to promote leadership development and gender equity in the areas of health, education and economic empowerment. The coalition has several committees that focus on health, education, public policy and economic development, which ensures that the lives of black females are improved by eliminating the discrepancies experienced in their communities. And I would now like to move for adoption. 
Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. And before President Causey speaks, I would like to recognize our colleague, Councilmember Priscilla Tyson, who is also a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated. Thank you, President Causey. Thank you. Thank you again. And um, we really appreciate you uh, recognizing our organization. As you said, my name is Crystal Causey, and I'm president of this coalition. Um, but at this point, I'd like my coalition sisters to introduce themselves as well before we go further. Good evening. I'm Linda Caney, founding president of the Central Ohio chapter. I'm very honored to be here on the policy committee. Hello, I'm Cynthia Sands. I'm the chapter historian. Good evening. I'm Jennifer St. Clair, and I'm third vice president of membership. Good evening. I'm Judge Kara Jameson, and I'm a member of public policy. Ms. Long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and for recognizing our chapter. I'm Betty Halton, I'm a founding member, I'm a parliamentarian, and I co-chair the Public Policy Committee. I'm Lisa Carter, I am the treasurer of the National Coalition. I'm Covington, I'm a member of the Education. Thank you. As you mentioned before, our mission is to advocate on behalf of black women and girls to promote leadership, development, and gender equity in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. So this is a great month of March to celebrate women's history. Um, just to let you know that within our core values, we do believe in gender equity. We believe in inclusion, respect, race, and social justice, integrity, and accountability, economic empowerment, and collaboration. We also develop strategic alliances with corporations, governments, and other nonprofits. And so once again, thank you, Councilwoman uh, Jaza Page and the entire Columbus City Council members. But there are a couple things that's still missing. On March 13th, we do have Ohio Legislative Day, which is taking place in the State House from 10 to 4 p.m. We also, on May 17th, we have our annual Trailblazer, um, which is award scholarships to local um, high school students within the Central Ohio area. We are going to be recognizing three local individuals, which uh, will be Christy Angel, CEO of the YWCA, Dr. Mashika Williams Roberts, Public Health Commissioner, and um, Senator Charlita Tavares. So we hope that you will attend that. It's going to be held at the Boathouse on um, May 17th. So thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from my colleagues? President Pro Tem Stanziano. Thank you, uh, Council Member Page. Just want to thank you all. Uh, I've been to a number of your programs, and uh, your all's engagement, enthusiasm, and dedication to not only your mission, but to our city and community is uh, second to none. And so excited that we have the op opportunity to recognize you tonight and look forward to continuing to work together uh, and encourage you to continue with your mission uh, because I continue to be inspired myself uh, and know how much you are inspiring others across our city. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Councilmember Page. Um, I want to just say again, thank you to each each one of you. Uh, I know you're involved in many organizations that are helping to move this community forward, but this particular organization is is very important to our community. Um, to focus on women and girls of special of color are um, are much needed in our community. When I look at some of the numbers where we stand and, and the data tells where we are, that it is important to have an organization like this focusing on our health because of the health disparities in our community, focusing on education, again, because we certainly have know the, the numbers of our young people that are dropping out of school, which prevents them from having a um, better quality of life, and certainly economic development. And um, so I appreciate what you're doing. Um, very supportive, uh, and just want to continue to work with you as we continue to move our, our city forward, because it's important for us to take care of the least of those, and if when you take care of them, every Everybody else is successful. So thank you for your work and your advocacy. Thank you. Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. I'll just briefly add, um, and thank you, Councilmember Page, for uh, introducing this resolution. Your mission is, is clearly second to none. Um, but I also want to thank each of you for being the individual leaders that you are. It's really incredible to um, you know, to, to see today this collection of leadership here representing the organization and um, a mission on its own doesn't go anywhere without that individual dedication and really lifetime of dedication um, that each of you has to public service. So I, I, I thank you for that. 
Thank you, council members. This evening I have uh, a resolution. It's 0054X 2018, and it's to honor and recognize and celebrate the life of service in service of Private First Class Leroy William Bryant. Leroy was born on February 13th, 1928 in Georgia and later moved to Columbus, Ohio and into the American Edition community where he attended Columbus City Schools. Leroy served in the Korean War, achieving the rank of Private First Class and has received numerous awards for his actions, including a Purple Heart, a Combat Infantry Badge, the Prisoner of War Medal, the United Nations Service Medal, and many more. During battle, Leroy's platoon was captured, and while being held a prisoner of war, Leroy became ill and passed away in North Korea. Now, after more than 50 years since his passing, Leroy's remains have been exchanged with North Korea and taken to Honolulu for DNA testing and identification. As we speak, Private First Class Bryant's remains are on their way back to Columbus, so he can finally be laid to rest. Uh, a funeral home this weekend reached out to council about this, and um, we often talk and, and honor the lives of those who uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice. Mr. Um, Leroy from Columbus uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice, uh, and this council is honoring that. He would be 90 years old today. Uh, he has two living family members here in Columbus. Um, we will, as a city, honor him um, as his body is processed from Columbus, from the airport on Wednesday to the funeral home followed by a public service on uh, Friday. Um, and I wanted his family to know that even 50 years later, this city still uh, appreciates his service and we are extremely proud um, and uh, grateful for his sacrifice. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Um, are there any comments by our elected officials or members of the administration? I see uh, Hilltop uh, represented. I see Franklinton Area Commission represented. I see Judge Barrows. Judge Barrows, do you have any no, comments from the court? Thank you. Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of ordinances or re resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may I have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. The following ordinance appear on agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinance numbers into the record? First reading of 30-day legislation is as follows. Finance Committee Ordinance 425-2018, 465, and 544-2018. Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 510-2018. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee Ordinance 586 and 587-2018. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 458, 500, and 580-2018. Zoning Committee Ordinances 610 and 612-2018. May I have a motion for the uh, approval of these items as needed as consent actions? Thank you. Clerk, would you please read the uh, consent actions? Items, I apologize. Sure. Resolution of Expression 52X-2018, Finance Committee, Ordinances 447, 463, and 521-2018, Recreation and Parks Committee, Resolutions 21X, 23X-2018, and Ordinances 202, 452, 453, 454, and 455-2018, Public Safety Committee, 
Ordinance 153-2018, Public Service and Transportation Committee Resolution 33X-2018, Ordinances 485 and 488-2018, Economic Development and Small Business Committee Ordinances 529, 578, 591, and 625-2018, Housing Committee Ordinances 519, 597, 598, 599, 600, 601, 602, 603, 604, 623 2018. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee, Ordinances 299, 317, 318, 319, 358, and 584 2018. Technology Committee, Ordinance 344 2018. Public Utilities Committee, Resolution 35X 2018. Ordinances 354, 384, 416, 446, 475 2018 and appointments from the mayor's office numbered A 0067, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, and 79 2018. Thank you. And now, seeing no uh, speakers in the consent agenda, may I have approval by the uh, for des items designated as consent? Please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Stenziano? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes, with the exception of 0319-2018 and 0584-2018, on which I am abstaining. President Harden? Yes. Uh, consent package uh, passed. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30-day uh, table and tabled uh, emergency legislation. The first committee this evening is the Finance Committee. Councilmember Elizabeth Brown chairs that committee. The floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight we have one ordinance in finance, uh, Ordinance 0517-2018, to authorize the Finance and Management Director on behalf of the Real Estate Management Office to pay rent associated with existing lease agreements to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $1,233,581 from the Special Income Tax Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance covers four existing lease agreements for office space for the Departments of Development and Public Safety and an internal memorandum of understanding with the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, Deputy Director Gian Gardella, is there anything you'd like to add about these lease agreements? President Harden, uh, Chair Brown, members of council, um, as you referenced, these are essentially lease renewals, uh, 1.2 million out of the special income tax fund. Um, one of those leases is for economic development and the development department. Uh, the other three are associated with um, public safety for our call center, the 911 call center in Fairwood, and uh, for uh, internal affairs. Uh, in police and professional standards in uh, the fire division. So I thank you for your consideration of this ordinance this evening. Thank you so much. Are there questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is the Environment Committee. Councilmember Emmanuel Remy chairs that committee. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Tonight, Environment Committee, we have ordinance number 0436 2018 to authorize the Director of Public Service to establish an encumbrance of $16,706,000 to pay refuse tipping fees to the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, otherwise known as SWACO, for the Division of Refuse Collection pursuant to an existing lease agreement to establish encumbrances up to $20,000 for tire disposal and construction demolition, material disposal to authorize the expenditure of $16,726,000 or so much thereof as may be necessary from the special income tax fund for waste disposal tipping fees and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage by, by vote, uh, voice vote, excuse me. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Ms. Page? Mr. Remy? Mr. Stenziano? Ms. Tyson. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Ordinance pass. Thank you. That is all I have tonight for in the Environment Committee. Thank you, Chair Remy. The next committee to come before council is the Economic Development and Small Business Committee. Councilmember Jiza Page is chair. Councilmember. 
Thank you, President Hardin. This evening, we have Ordinance 0218-2018 to accept the application of BZ Management Partners et al. for the annexation of certain territory containing approximately 26.3 acres in Blendon Township. If there are no further questions or comments, I would like to move for passage. Oh, yes. Sorry. I would first like to move to take this ordinance from the table. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Ramey, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. I now move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Ramey, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. And we have Ordinance 0520-2018 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Vertec LLC and Vertec Corporation for a property tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a proposed total investment of approximately $5,148,000, of which approximately $4,758,000 will be related to the renovation of approximately 25,600 square feet, retention of 35 full-time jobs, and the creation of 15 net new full-time permanent positions. Are there any additional comments from the department? Thank you, Councilmember Page. Uh, this would be a um, enterprise zone tax abatement that lines up with how we traditionally do projects in the city of Columbus. I would draw your attention to the wage requirements. Um, we are looking at wages that range from $17.50 an hour, excuse me, to $37.50 an hour. So as we consider our tax abatement recommendations moving forward, this is in line with what we hope to see. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have, President Hardin. Thank you, Chair Page. The next committee to come before council is the Neighborhoods Committee. President Pro Tim Stinziano is chair. Thank you, President Hardin. Uh, tonight we have one ordinance in neighborhood, uh, ordinance. 518-2018 to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the neighborhood initiative sub fund to support the my brother's keeper grants program and to authorize the director of development of neighborhoods to enter into grant agreements with various service providers uh, i would first really like to thank uh, the director and the department of neighborhoods as well as your leadership president harden uh, for your work on the mbk initiative i think we're all aware not only from a city but a country perspective uh, the work that president obama's initiative has had uh, for young men of color in our community and you're all really seeing that work come to fruition throughout the city of Columbus. I know a number of us participated um, in a number of working groups and partnering organizations that over 500 young men of color have been impacted and look forward to your ongoing leadership. With that, I would like to pass it to you for further comments. Thank you, uh, President Pro Tim, for, for your leadership um, and engagement, uh, and really this entire council's engagement on MBK. As we've said before, uh, MBK is not a one-off initiative, it's not a one-off program, but more so it's a commitment from this council, this city, from our mayor that uh, we um, will continue to lift up and provide access to young men of color in our community. Um, this is one piece of that. Uh, it is uh, putting dollars on the streets for um, organizations who have been doing the work for many years of supporting young people, uh, young, young people of color in several different areas. I'm appreciative of the work that was done by Kerwin Institute, who helped us um, go out and talk. Um, council member, actually every council member uh, came out and co-chaired um, conversations with uh, uh, Kerwin and the Department of Neighborhoods uh, to hear from the community leaders, the organizations that were uh, a part of that work. Um, this is, again, one piece of MBK. I don't want uh, it to be um, seen as a culmination of work, um, but it is a piece of a greater um, commitment that the city has for our young men of color. And so, again, I thank uh, Council Member, uh, President Pro Tem Cinziano, and I think uh, our chair, person has a little, our, our director has a little bit more information on this grants program. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you, President Hardin and uh, President Pro Tem Stenziano and members of council. Um, the Department of Neighborhoods MBK program will be seeking applications from community partners to enhance the infrastructure of programming for boys and young men of color throughout the city of Columbus. That's what this grant opportunity will do. This funding opportunity is designed to build system capacity um, and to implement programming specifically around the My Brother's Keeper vulnerability areas that were identified in the Kerwin report. Those areas are education, economics, health, and safety. A key component of the grant process will be to foster collaboration between and among agencies and programs. And so therefore, the grant application uh, will Grant applications should provide evidence of collaboration um, between um, agencies and programs that are serving boys and young men of color. Within the next few weeks, the Department of Neighborhoods will announce the date and time for the grant information session. All agencies that are interested in applying for the grant will be required to attend the information session. During that session, we will provide an overview of the findings from the MBK report um, and the research that the Kerwin Institute um, presented and review the grant eligibility uh, criteria and answer additional questions related to the grant application process. If individuals would like to be included on that email list, you can, they can submit their contact information to mbkgrants at columbus.gov. And you can also check the mbkvillage.org website. The Kerwin report is uploaded on that website. And lastly, if individuals um, would like, they can always call the Department of Neighborhoods at 614-645-1993, and we will add their um, contact information to the mailing list for the grant application. Thank you, Director uh, William Scott. And President Postum. If there are no further questions or comments from our colleagues, I'll move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. So we have a neighborhood, if I can move on to public utilities. Sure. Tonight, public utilities bring forward ordinance 0387-2018 to authorize the city attorney to spend city funds to acquire and accept in good faith certain fee simple title and lesser real estate located in the vicinity of Olentangy River Road, Columbus, Ohio, and contract for associated professional services in order for a DPU to timely complete the lower Olentangy Tunnel Public Improvement Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $5,253,800 from the general obligation bond fund. Uh, these professional services will include surveys, title work, and appraisals. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Ordinance 0427-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a planned modification of the Professional Construction Management Services Agreement with URS Corporation Ohio for the Division of Water to authorize a transfer and an expenditure up to $2,083,000 within the Water General Obligations Bond Fund and to authorize an amendment to the 2017 Capital Improvements Budget. Uh, the original contract anticipated the professional construction management services would be provided under multiple contract modifications over multiple years in order to support the construction projects. This is a 13th modification and will again cover professional construction management tasks from June 2018 through May of 2019. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Okay. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. The final ordinance in public utilities this evening is ordinance 0429-2018 to authorize the director of public utilities to enter into a construction contract with underground utilities incorporated for the Stephen Drive area water line improvements project to authorize the appropriation and transfer of $2,988,604.53 from the water systems reserve fund to the water supply revolving loan account fund to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $2,988,604.53 from the Water Supply Revolving Loan Account Fund for the Division of Water and authorize an amendment of the 2017 Capital Improvements Budget. Uh, this project will construct necessary improvements to the water distribution system as mentioned in the Stephen Drive area, which is in the hilltop. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. 
That's all I have in my committees this evening, President Harden. Thank you, President Pro Tem. Um, next committee to come before council is the Health and Human Services Committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. Thank you. I have ordinance number 0337-2018 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Central Ohio Hospital Council for the Better Birth Outcomes Collaboration Grant Program in the amount of $100,000 to authorize the appropriation of $100,000 to the Health Department and the Health Department's Private Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. The purpose of the Baby and Me Tobacco Free Program is to increase quit, quit rates among pregnant and postpartum women by offering individualized tobacco sensation treatment and providing incentives for remaining smoke-free. This program aims to improve birth outcomes as part of a larger strategy to reduce infant mortality. Between 2015 and 16, enrollment in the program increased from 38 to 97 participants. Of the 200, 2016 program graduates, 87 remained smoke-free through the baby's first year of life, and also 100% of the program graduates delivered full-term healthy babies. Last week, we passed legislation to accept a grant from the Franklin County Board of Health to provide tobacco sensation services for the Community Sensation Initiative Grant Program in the amount of $26,000, and that was for group sessions. And so, and, um, so that, those dollars supported um, supplies and additional support. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0505-2018. It's to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into a grant agreement with the Clintonville Beachwald Community Resource Center in support of the family services and the choice food pantry and to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the neighborhood initiative subfund. Uh, I'm now going to turn over the um, presentation to my, the co-sponsor, Councilmember Michael Stenziano. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as I kind of discuss this ordinance, if Bill uh, Owens, Executive Director of the CRC, uh, could come forward along with some of the other CRC teams. Uh, CRC's Family Services and Choice Food Pantry provided a record of nearly half million meals to hungry neighbors from 66, 66 zip codes in 2017. Uh, this does not include their thrice weekly community dinners and sack lunches that they provide. Um, and as they'll tell you, clients include homeless families, but also are many working poor with insufficient income to meet basic needs, many of whom who must decide between paying bills and feeding their children. Um, on average, they hand out about 10,000 pounds of fresh produce per week through a partnership with the Mid-Ohio Food Bank. Uh, and really, these are emergency food needs, and this ordinance will help meet those needs. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Executive Director, and thank you all for being here and all you continue to do for the city. Thank you, Council Member Stenziano, and thank you, City Council, for having us here this evening. Uh, my name is Bill Owens. I'm the Executive Director of the Clintonville Beachwald Community Resources Center. I'm joined by Beth Stewart McGee, who is our Family Services Director. Uh, and that is the program that CRC has had as its centerpiece since I came to the agency in 1995. I've worked in community mental health here in Columbus for 10 years prior to that. I'm a proud son of Columbus, Ohio. And I couldn't be prouder of this city when I know the work that we do through the CRC and the support that we get from our neighbors and our community members and, and from our city. Um, when this agency started in 1971, the food pantry was housed inside of a bathtub. Uh, today, we're able to serve nearly a half million meals a day, or, excuse me, a year. That this is an agency that not only is providing that important service and that important food to people at, at an emergency in their life when they need to have that support to be able to keep their household together and to survive. Not only does that happen, but they have Beth Stewart McGee here who is able to meet with them and not only provide that transaction of food that they must have, but also to, to be able to have the relationship that they need to make the best of the assets that they have, the assets of them as human beings and everything that they have to provide to their families and to our community. That 
we are not only providing food, but we are providing food for their soul and their spirit and for them to continue on. And connections to all the other programs and supports that are here in our community to keep them together. Um, I couldn't be prouder. I couldn't be prouder of this agency and the work that we do um, and what Beth's been able to do to really embrace those folks uh, that are coming to us in need. Over the years that I've been there, Beth's been there for 20 years, I've been there for 22 years. We've seen a lot of changes. One of the changes that we've seen is that we are welcoming refugees and immigrants from faraway lands. People that have a lot to learn about the culture here, about the language, and about how we have a great life here in Columbus and all that we have to be proud of. That we are able to reach out to folks and embrace them and, and that they figure out, wow, these are, this is a really cool place. This isn't just a place that's handing out food. These people really like us. So this is, uh, this is a proud day. It's a proud day. And I want to thank you very much for the support of the CRPC, the support of a great city. Uh, and I want to congratulate my colleague, Beth Stewart McGee, for making the program what it is today. Beth, do you have any comments? Just thank you so much. Well, we truly appreciate all the CRC does for our community. And having had the opportunity to tour uh, and meet some of the clients, uh, it is a special place. And I know a lot of that's your personality, uh, but also a number of volunteers that make it so wonderful. So thank you for all you do. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, and I will return it to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, I want to say thank you, Bill, for your leadership. And certainly, as you just mentioned, that uh, once the emergency food needs are met, that you are able to provide help and referrals for housing and clothing, finances, and other necessities that individuals may have. Uh, I just really, do, like I said, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And uh, again, part of our local food action plan is to make sure that we improve access to and, and education about healthy food, affordable food, and local food, and make sure people have access to that. And I thank you for your leadership in doing that. And if there are no other questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. That's all I have my committee this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Thank Look, you. And thank you. The last committee that we have before Council this evening is the Rules and Reference Committee, which I chair. Um, at this point, I move to introduce Ordinance 0650 2018 to submit to the electors of the City of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular primary election on May 8, 2018, the question of amending the Charter of the City of Columbus, such question to be known as the proposed Charter Amendment Number 1 City Council. This legislation gives Columbus residents the opportunity to vote on expanding our council and creating geographic districts where members run from as recommended by the Charter Review Committee. The nine-member committee was led by Stephanie Coe with input with, from res representatives from across our diverse city. They listened to residents' concerns about representation. This group also met publicly and extensively. Uh, and I believe you can find about 25 hours of testimony available on YouTube on the City of Columbus uh, YouTube page as well. In September 2016, this city's commi committee adopted these recommendations, and after much discussion, we are offering the electorate the opportunity to vote on this proposal. Tonight, we propose a ballot question regarding the size and structure and appointment of city, city uh, system of, city, uh, of Columbus City Council. This amendment would increase the size of council from seven members to nine, change the form of council from at-large to at-large by place, Extend the time period for filing a vacancy from 30 days to 45 days for the public hearing. Before I move forward, I would like to thank Stephanie Coe, who chaired the committee, and all those who engaged um, throughout the process um, and had a, a substantial amount of conversation. I would also say that this is not an easy conversation. Um, there are f good folks who believe on, uh, on both sides uh, about how this, uh, how this council functions. And I think that that is important that we not shy away from important conversations like how we govern ourselves. Uh, before I uh, ask for uh, comments from my colleagues, uh, we do have a few uh, speakers on this uh, uh, ordinance. Um, I am going to call up, so the first speaker is Mr. 
uh, David Harewood. Mr. Harewood, welcome to council. Um, would you please restate your name, uh, any organization that you may represent, and you have three minutes. Sure. My name is David Harewood. I am the campaign director for Everyday People for Positive Change. Thank you for acknowledging that there are good people on both sides of this debate who each have. I believe that both sides of this argument each have valid reasons for what we want and valid reasons for how we think this city should be governed. The fact is that your alternative still votes at large. It still dilutes votes. It still doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a direct pipeline within every area of the city to someone on city council. I have act. I know people who have called you guys and called you guys and waited for months. I'll get a call back. I don't really know why that is. I know that there are areas of this city that have been clamoring for help for years, and you guys end up giving tax abatements to places that are already being pumped up. Now, I don't think that either of those solutions are magic bullets, but I do think we sent you guys a petition that had as many signatures valid it came before and you gave the same argument to put it down that Pfeiffer did. And that's why we are filing. That is why we filed this morning with the Ohio Supreme Court. And again, I do think this should be an honest and civil debate. But this ruling that you're putting down, I have to object to wholeheartedly, especially given the work that we all put in and the arguments that we all had. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Harrowwood. Um, you're okay with spending your minute left? Sure. Are there any questions uh, or comments from Mr. Harrowwood? Thank you, sir, for uh, your work and for coming down to council this evening. Thank you. The next uh, person to come before council or to submit a speaker request is Mr. Willis Brown. Mr. Brown, welcome back to council. Uh, would you please state your name, your uh, address, any organization that you may represent? Um, and of course, you have three minutes. Yes. Uh, Willis Brown, member of the uh, Everyday People for Positive Change at 164 North Monroe Avenue. And, and you know we we constantly are battling this thing all the time. At no point in time did the city came to us and say, "Look, you know, let's have a conversation about it." You had a study done. It compared our city with a city that doesn't even have the same population. You all know the people who did that, and yet you, you know, you you welcome their report. The report is very clear. You're duping the public again. One is that it says. When we were running in 2016, you said seven was okay. You did a study, you say nine. And then what the study says and its, and, and its function is that you pick someone from your area, but everyone in the city votes for that person in that district. How is that representation? Therefore, it still allows the power brokers, the people who fund your campaigns and where you get your resources, to dictate the outcome. Because the person that live in a district, how can they go around and, and, and campaign if they don't have the money. So it goes back to if you select that, if you, if council, Mayor Coleman or the ex-Mayor Coleman or whoever says we want this person, you can give them more money. They can then go out there and campaign. You can use this, the, the media and you can get elected or put in the, in the spot. And, and, and I think that's, just, that's duping the public. What we're proposing is 10 districts based on population and three at large, 13. You have to live in that district, and the people that put you there will vote for you. If you cut the money influence, which is a fair system. But what we have here is, 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 is a real antiquated system. I mean, we, we look here and see who's been selected. Mayor Coleman select four African Americans here. And I go back to saying that's, that seems impressive. But as African American, do we need four people to do the work that one can do? What about the Asians? What about the Latinos, the Hispanic? What about the Africans? Without their input in Columbus, Morse Road would die 
The West Side would be economically in disaster. What about the Asian? How come we don't have them represented here? They don't matter. As long as they can do the work, forget you. you don't, they don't earn the merit to be here. Why, aren't they, why didn't Mayor Coleman select one of them instead of four African Americans? Are, are we inept that we need four? What about sharing it with the others? But that's the racist councils that we have, that y'all support. Therefore, that forced us to file. And I have a, a document, can you have one to, to collect this and, and distribute to y'all? And this is what pushed us to that point to say, we have to go to the, to the Supreme Court. Let it be in a neutral environment. But as, as it sits here, we have a racist council that only promotes that of white and black. There are no grays in Columbus. And yet we just heard how Columbus welcome immigrants to do what? To be the slave, the servant? How come they're not here? They're not educated enough? Or they don't pay enough to, to get up here or kiss the ring finger of Mayor Coleman? I don't know. But why isn't it the case? The Asians, the Africans, and the Hispanics mean nothing to y'all or to Mayor Coleman? I feel as an African American, that's an insult. And your support a system that kept us out of this, this seat for many years. So, so that's why we, I want you to have a sight of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, the last speaker to come before uh, council on this uh, ordinance is Mr. Joe Motil. Mr. Motil, welcome back to council. Uh, would you please uh, state your name, your address, any new organization that you may represent, and you have three minutes. President Harden, not used to saying that. Members of City Council, Joe Motel, I reside at 167 West Cook Road in Columbus. First of all, I want to express my disappointment for purposely presenting meaningful legislation and not placing it on the regular agenda that is released early for public viewing. Uh, this is two weeks in a row now that you've pulled this stunt that prohibits concerned citizens like myself and others to better prepare our statements and to speak about these important matters that affect the livelihoods of our citizens. It's bad enough that you adjourn the regular meeting right before the public comment portion just so you could turn off the TV cameras so the viewing public doesn't get to hear comments from the public about concerned matters of this council in this city. Once again, as I spoke before this, chart, this proposal, back I believe it was in July, uh, this proposed charter amendment is really nothing short of an extension by two members of the current at-large makeup of city council that will only add two more councils to rubber stamp legislation, grant tax abatements to their friendly campaign, contributing developers and billion dollar corporations that continue pouring millions of our city's tax dollars into our downtown, the short north, Polaris, Easton, and the Arena District, while our older established neighborhoods and its citizens continue to be neglected and ignored. This proposal does not allow for true district representation. You all know it. If you allow for every voter across the city to vote for representatives of each district, that is not district representation, period. This ill-advised proposal is being made due to this council and the city attorney knowing that a lawsuit is forthcoming and actually has been, and I didn't know that until just 10 minutes ago. And this proposal is only going to delay the voters an opportunity to vote on the ballot initiative which was presented to you by Mr. Beard and will ultimately be allowed by the Ohio Supreme Court. So if you're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' dollars fighting the forthcoming lawsuit, and then another lawsuit will, which will most likely be filed by the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund on violations of the Voting Rights Act on top of being responsible for possibly paying for a special election, this is going to cost the taxpayers dearly. And it's all because you do not want to give up your control, your power over the people of this city, but rather continue doing the bidding for the rich and powerful that fill your campaign coffers. This proposal is yet another slap in the face for democracy in Columbus, and it is especially appalling when it comes from so-called democratic office holders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Motil. Just want to recognize you have 30 seconds left. You suspend us. And I just want to make the point that this uh, conversation, your, your comments will be, are part of general uh, meeting, so um, it, the cameras are still on, so. I know this. Thank you. Yeah. I hear on you. Thank you, Mr. Motil. Thank you. Uh, 
like, like I said, there, this is an issue that is not easy. It's, it will spark debate from every corner of our, conversa our, our community. Um, certainly, um, from this council as well. Are there comments from members of uh, this council? Seeing none, um, Councilman Marimi, I apologize. I'm going to call for uh, second reading, the wave second reading. And you can you can speak now, please. For over 102 years, the city of Columbus has had the current structure in place. As a community leader for the past eight years, I have had the opportunity to listen at the street level what the community is looking for from their council representation. And it is clear that they want accessibility, council members that will listen and advocate on their behalf. Time and time again, this body has demonstrated that they are willing to go to all stretches of our great city to ensure that the voices of the community are heard. The prosperity that this city is seeing today is unparalleled from any time in our past. We also know we have our challenges and there are those in this community who don't feel the successes that others are experiencing within the city. But this body stands ready to help everyone throughout the community. There is a certain push to change that structure of this body that continues to rise to a level of conversation by a few that resonates much larger than I believe the sentiment of this community cares to enact. It is my belief the community has little to no interest in enacting a system that ultimately will be costlier. It is with this in mind that we come to tonight's legislation. The question before us is whether we should take the recommendations of the Charter Review Committee and put them on the ballot. This process, a very public process, gave the citizens, every citizen, the opportunity to provide input, direction, and ultimately the committee came up with a plan which is before us tonight. Although I do not think this is the right plan for the City of Columbus, I am voting to support that process that brought us here and to put it in on the ballot for the voters to decide. It is my belief that the residents of the City of Columbus will agree with me that this is not the Columbus way, but I am more than willing to allow the democratic process to take place to prove once and for all that we do things the right way in the City of Columbus and our citizens like the fact that they have seven people that they can lobby to make change for their neighborhood not a plan that gives them something less and costs much more than that. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Thank you, uh, Councilman Marimi. Um, so in order to place the Charter Amendment on the ballot, the Council must pass legislation more than 60 days out from a regular election. 60 days from May 8th, uh, election is March 9th. Therefore, this is the last regularly scheduled meeting before that deadline. Um, it's for this reason that I'm asking uh, my colleagues to uh, waive second reading on Ordinance 0650 2018. Um, may I get a, s a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Harden. Uh, or, uh, second reading waived. At this point, I would like to move for passage by voice. Clerk, call the roll. Ms. Brown? By voice. Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Page? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Stenziano? Yes. Ms. Tyson? No. President Harden? Yes. Uh, ordinance passed. Thank you. Uh, we will, see, this is the last committee the, to come before council this uh, evening. It is 6.02. Uh, um, and so seeing no uh, further uh, business before council, I uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hart. Uh, meeting adjourned. There are a couple uh, speakers uh, that we'll take shortly. Meeting number 14 will now come to order. May the clerk call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Can I get a, me a motion to dispense with the reading of this journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. We will now go to the zoning committee. Council member uh, Tyson chairs this committee. Council member, chair, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Um, as we begin zoning, before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents, three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes. And we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth, nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Uh, excuse me. The, I'm sorry, thank you. Are there, I think there's some other speakers. Miss, is Miss Bricker and Miss Muller here? You, you have to also do that. So again, will you please raise your right hand and be sworn in? I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you. The first ordinance on the zoning agenda is 054-2018. It's to rezone 1831 West Case Road, being 0.7 acres located on the south side of West Case Road, 1,300 feet east of Moorgate Drive from R Rural District to RR Rural Residential District. The applicant is Nicholas J. Brown and Rachel A. Brown. The proposed use is a single unit dwelling the C department's recommendation is approval, and the Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is approval at nine to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The next ordinance, 0581-2018, I move to table this indefinitely. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance, 0590-2018, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.039, R4, res residential district, 3321.05, B2, vision clearance, 3332.05, area district lot with requirements, 3332.15, R4 area district requirements, 3332.18D basis of computing area, 3332.21B building lines, 3332.25 maximum side yards required, 3332.26 minimum side yard permitted, 3332.27 rear yard, and 3332.29 height districts of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 77 East Russell Street to permit three single unit dwellings with reduced development standards in the R4 residential district and to repeal ordinance number 1215 uh, 121501 passed July 23rd of 2001 and ordinance number 1600 2009 passed December 7th of 2009. This is a council amendment. It's the same development, but we are asking the amendment to be from a C4 to an R to an R4. The proposed use is three single unit dwellings. The city development department is approval and the Italian Village Commission's recommendation um, was unanimous is approval. I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And the uh, final ordinance in this committee this evening is to rezone 2539 Gantz Road, being 4.80 acres located on the west side of Gantz Road, 1,000 feet north of Dwyer Road from our rural district to LM Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant is Levesque Commercial Construction and Development. The proposed use is a self-storage facility. The city department's recommendation is disapproval, and the Southwest Area Commission's recommendation is approval. I would now ask for a staff presentation.
Uh, the site consists of two undeveloped parcels zoned in the R Rural District. The requested LM Limited Manufacturing District will allow the development of a self-storage facility. The proposed limitation text restricts the use of the property to a self-storage facility and includes commitments to building setbacks, building height, traffic access, buffering and screening, lighting and building materials. The request also includes a commitment to develop the site as shown on the submitted site plan. The Southwest Area Plan recommends medium, low density residential land uses at this location and further states that non-residential uses are not appropriate in existing residential areas. While the limitation text and site plan reflect efforts to screen <clears throat> and buffer, buffer the surrounding single unit dwellings, staff believes that a self-storage facility at this location is not compatible with the residential and rural character of the area and therefore city department's recommendation is disapproval. Okay, any questions from my colleagues? Is the applicant in the room? Do you want to make any comments this evening? All right. All right. Thank you. We do have um, two speakers. The first speaker um, is Ms. Pam Muller. And you can come up to the podium. You have three minutes to speak. And she is speaking against the... Um, this ordinance. Good evening, Ms. Muller. Good evening. Mueller, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here to, uh, against this uh, change to the light manufacturing. And as I stated before, you know, I have, um, my own research has indicated the criminal activity associated with the storage units. Uh, the negative effect on, uh, effect on property values. And, um, you know, when it comes down to it, I, 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 I got to go back to um, your own, the, the own city planners. They say this shouldn't be put there. The 2009 plan that was put together, it's 68 pages of, of uh, charts and detailed uh, colored pictures and, and and they are saying this little part on Gantz Road should not be, uh, should remain rural residential. Uh, you can see the pictures, it's all rural residential, churches, houses, apartments. Um, we started this on September 14th with the Development Commission zoning. Um, we were not, myself and my other neighbors were not notified of the Southwest uh, meeting that took place initially. So we did not attend that one. Our first time uh, into this was involving the September 14th meeting for the zoning commissioners. All four commissioners denied it. Um, they had various reasons. One, they were admonished for filing too soon. It was, uh, uh, they was bannered about that it was uh, uh, to have this put into a residential area where there are all other properties who are not incorporated, that that wasn't a norm of some sort. And, some, and, and so I, I, I just have to hold the city council to what the city planners have said, um, what the commissioners have said, and, um, and, I, and I, I, I hope that that will be... Uh, meaningful in your decision making this evening. Thank you for coming down and sharing your comments. The next speaker is Holly Baker Bricker and she is in support of the legislation. My name is Holly Baker Bricker and I live at 2545 Gans Road and I'm a sister of the property owners. Uh, I wanted to add something that no one else has brought up that I know of and that's beside the buffers that the proposed facility already has, the landscaping, trees, the fencing, 
this property has a natural dense tree line that runs along the back north and south edges of the property. It was also along the west edge of the property where the houses are located until earlier the last summer when Asplen came in and thinned out and cleared the brush and trees. A few of the houses are now visible along the west edge, whereas before they were not, <clears throat> and the other houses sit outside of this tree line and do not even see this property. The plans do not call for removing any of the existing tree line. The facility will be within that natural buffer before its landscaping even starts. There was mention at the last meeting about a family business. I'm not sure what was meant by that, but I can assure you that as nice a man as Mr. Levesque is, he is not a family member of ours, and the rezoning has nothing to do with a family business. It was also mentioned of property values being affected. We were concerned about that as well until we sat down with Mr. Levesque and his attorney and actually went over the plans. My understanding is that letters were sent out early on asking people to contact them so they could meet everyone and answer any concerns before any of the meetings were set. Once we saw the actual plans, we no longer had that worry. My understanding is that only two people out of the whole list of names called to meet, and that was myself and the pastor for the church, Pastor Sheets, who has since passed. No one else cared enough to make that call. I personally did not attend the second meeting because there had been no opposition to that point. I regret not going, be, not going because the Development Commission only heard one side of the story when they voted. There was also mention that the family just wants to make money. They have every right to sell the property and whether they make money or not is irrelevant to the rezoning issues and frankly is no one else's business. But this isn't about money, it's about easing the hardship on my family that continues to grow yearly. It's about not adding to the traffic issues and the crime issues that all of us currently have by adding more houses or apartments to the mix. I again ask that the rezoning of this property be approved so that the plan, monitor, and secured facility can go in so that the traffic congestion and crime element aren't added to and so that my family can finally move on from the growing hardship of maintaining and farming this property. Thank you. I don't see a representative here from the Area Commission, but I know that the Area Commission, it was a unanimous vote on this um, legislation. And let's see, is there a rebuttal, a rebuttal from the family? I, mean, I, think, I know the sister just spoke, but no. Okay, seeing none. Uh, any questions from my council members? Council Member Brown. I know that, as you noted, Council Member, the Southwest Area Commission isn't here, but um, is there somebody that can speak to, a little more to their reasoning behind the unanimous approval? You, yeah, is that all right, Council Member? Chair? Robert Levesque with Levesque Construction Development. Uh, so speaking in regarding the meeting with the Southwest Area Commission, uh, their logic regarding the uh, UNESCO approval was uh, due to the fact that the traffic count generated by this facility would be um, eight cars a day on average, as opposed to um, possibly more than 100 cars due to uh, multifamily development uh, in the back there on Gantz Road. So uh, the thought was is to keep the density even lower than what the future land use calls for, plan calls for, and to not increase the the traffic on Gantz is is their primary concern. Thank you, Mr. Levesque. Right. Thank you. Oh, oh. Councilmember Brown. I'm I'm having a little difficulty understanding for the moment, and maybe Ms. Pine can offer me some clarity 
All right, the, my, uh, the city department's recommendation is disapproval, correct? That is correct. And the area commission is unanimous in saying approval. That is correct. And the area that is confusing for me is why the city is saying no, but the area commission is saying yes. I don't quite get it. Yeah, we heard well, right? So maybe somebody can help me because I don't quite get it. Uh, thank you, Councilman I know I'm a little Brown. slow sometimes. I think Mr. So. I say Mr. Lombardi. I, I, um, in, the present, in the staff presentation, I think that they shared, maybe because he was so low, so quiet. Could you, again, just share why the staff voted no? I think it's because of what their area plan stated, and that's why. But Ms. Pine, who's, Ms. Pine, are you going to speak? Or yes, I will, I will speak. Uh, yes, uh, so Council Member Brown, um, the Southwest Area Plan recommends low to medium density residential uses for this area. And when Planning Division reviewed it, they had made the comment that this commercial industrial use is not consistent with the area plan recommendation. There are no other commercial or industrial uses in the vicinity. Uh, sometimes we will deviate from the area plan recommendation when it makes sense to do so. Uh, but in this, this particular situation, this would be the very first uh, commercial or industrial use introduced along this corridor. I think the reasoning with the area commission was because of the recommendation for the low to medium density residential, that could open up the door for multi-unit residential development. Low to medium could be like six to eight to 10 units to the acre. It's, it's not really defined in the Southwest plan. So it's very well possible that somebody could have come in there with an AR-12 apartment residential district and developed apartments. So I think what the reasoning of the Southwest Area Commission, at least in my conversations with Stephanie Coe about this site was that nobody on the Area Commission wanted to see apartments start to get developed along this corridor because this is like, this is the first tract that's coming in and being developed. Um, so they thought that the self-storage facility would be a much less lower impact use that would not as negatively impact the surrounding residential units as would an apartment complex. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Chair, I'm sorry. Councilmember Brown, I yes. Have one more clarifying question for um, uh, Ms. Pine. So uh, the the staff often does uh, make an approval for something that is inconsistent with uh, an area plan. You know, it happens every once in a while. I don't know if it's often or every once in a while, but it happens. Um, and typically, I'm trying to understand, like typically it'll be a, a denser use than what the area plan prescribes. So in this case, is it because the use changes from residential to commercial that you felt that staff felt it was kind of a bridge too far um, because other times they you know you do make exceptions and so I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what stands out and I really do understand the area commission's standpoint that they don't that oftentimes we do approve things that are denser than the area plan and they really don't want to see that um, so I'm, that's where my sort of confusion to complement what <laughs> Council Member Brown it's said. Thing. It's a right. brown thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I completely understand. Um, the, uh, as I stated, th this is really the first property that's getting developed in this corridor. So, and there is no commercial uses established. There is a church, but that's not really commercial enough. If this was like maybe a nursing home or an assisted living facility. So I guess it just depends on the degree of the use and what's surrounding and what other factors are there. And in this particular situation, we just did not feel that deviation from the area plan recommendation was warranted. Um, and then just to answer the other question about why did the area commission recommend one thing and staff the other, we, we review the applications independently of each other. Sometimes the area commission will ask what staff's recommendation is before they before they have their meeting, but most times, you know, we are independent. We staff will not change their mind because the community group supports it or opposes it. That's development commission's job and city council's job to take all those recommendations and and make up your minds uh, as to whether or not you support it. 
Councilmember Remy. I guess I have a hard time, you know, when if we were to turn this down, for instance, then we go back to you and we just hope for a better project to come along that's more in accordance with the plan. I mean, you know, I, I tend to defer to the community and, you know, with their unanimous approval, it's hard for me to say, well, the staff's got a better understanding of what the community wants. And so um, that's where I'm, you know, kind of confused. I wish somebody would have been here from the commission, but, um, but certainly, um, I have a hard time, you know, going against what the community wants. And I wanted to share. So this legislation that we're seeing today uh, is legislation that is from September of 2017. And there have been numerous meetings, and certainly um, Mr. Levesque has certainly been reaching out to the community. And based upon that, that's why this legislation today has um, a request amend as submitted to the clerk. Based upon those discussions, they have updated the landscaping and buffering commitments, as well as a new, long, new location opposite the propo proposed detention pond. I will also say that we've had really no individuals coming down and complaining. I recognize the fact that we did get a letter from Ms. Mueller um, in regards to um, her thoughts about the property, as well as the individual, the two families that um, live, you know, I think a joint, the adjoining property to this property. And both of the individuals, Ms. Patricia Jamison and um, Brian Heaston and Elizabeth Heaston, they both sent letters in um, support of this. And so, based upon that, if there are the, any other questions or comments, we should just take the vote. So, one, move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, and I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Um, seeing no uh, further business to come before the zoning committee, uh, may I get a motion to adjourn? Second. Clerk, call the roll, please. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. We stand adjourned.